Hello folks and welcome back. Uh, this lecture will cover, uh, cover chapter 7, email and other traditional tools for business communication. It seems a little weird to me to think about emails, a traditional tool uh, for business communication, but I guess that's uh, where we are now. And before you watch this clip, I did post, a, it's not a, a clip from the office, but it's sort of a funny, humorous look at email in real life. I thought it was a perfect uh, intro for this topic. So if you haven't seen that already, uh, go take a look at it. It's a couple minutes long, and then come back and tell me uh, what you think we can learn from this video. Uh, how, how many of those behaviors <laughs> do you recognize? Uh, maybe you've done some of those, or you've uh, had them uh, done to you, some of the faux pas and, and just a weirdness uh, that goes along with uh, email communication. But anyway, just let me know what you think, uh, what kind of uh, applications you can see there, and then uh, pick up from there. All right, and here are the uh, learning objectives for today. We've got six of them. Uh, we'll talk about the trade-offs associated with the rich richness, control, and constraints when choosing a communication channel. And these are very good. It's a very good terminology to work with, I think. It's very useful. Uh, we'll talk about principles for writing effective emails. <laughs> Always a big one for me. And if you're teaching already, you probably know how often students write really poor or ineffective emails. It's not because the you know, they're, they're, they're intentionally being rude or disrespectful or they're ignorant or anything like that. It's just nobody's taught them the principles before. Uh, so we'll definitely spend some time uh, on that. Uh, we'll talk about how to handle emotion effectively in online communications. Another huge one. I uh, know I'm not the only one who's ever uh, fired off an email or uh, uh, we'll save the social media for next time. But, <laughs> you know, fire off that email. You're you're kind of uh, in the heat of the moment. Your emotions, you've basically been emotionally hijacked. You just send that message, maybe even uh, <laughs> send it to a list and it comes back to bite you. Uh, or on the other hand, maybe you get an email and just totally derails you, sends you off the you know, off the rails. And then uh, later, uh, after you've cooled off, you realize, oh my God, you know, I totally overreacted to that. I misinterpreted what the person was saying. Uh, so it's a common problem. We'll talk about how to, how to handle that productively. Uh, we'll talk about strategies for effective instant messaging uh, in the workplace. Uh, we'll talk about uh, strategies for or, uh, texting, in other words. Uh, we'll talk about uh, strategies for managing digital message overload. This is one that's really been affecting yours truly uh, ever since I started teaching online, especially just the, uh, the, the, the avalanche of emails coming from students and uh, administrators and committee. It's just what a mess. Uh, trying to sort all that, and of course, everybody expects an instant response, it can really get overwhelming. And so how do you cope with that? Uh, then we'll talk about principles for effective phone conversations and the uh, video conferences. And this is a really important one, too. I think I've mentioned a few times how a lot of the job interviews are being conducted uh, either over on the phone or maybe a group call, but really increasingly uh, something like Skype, Adobe, what's the Adobe? I think Adobe Connect. Uh, so in other words, all of this stuff is highly, highly relevant. It's also very interesting. And there's a lot of, uh, even if you think you know everything there is to know, say, about email, <laughs> hopefully there'll be something here that will uh, be useful uh, for you. Anyway, uh, let's see what the chapter is going to look like. Uh, we'll start off talking about the rich richness, control of constraints, emails, online, com, instant messaging, message overload, and <laughs> conversations and video comps, uh, pretty much exactly the way those uh, objectives were laid out. All right, so we're going to be talking about three basic considerations uh, related to the different communication channels. So you can think about asking, okay, I've got an important message I need to deliver. Is it appropriate to use email? Should I just go to the person's office, meet face to face? Uh, what about a Skype meeting? All this sort of, you know, imagine you're asking yourself that question or you're at the company as a professional communicator, professional <laughs> communication expert, and they're asking you this information. Like, well, we don't know. Uh, what, what channels would be appropriate? And one of the ways you can get you can get at this topic is to break it into uh, components or different terms, different aspects. And that's what we're doing here with these uh, terms. And we'll start with the, this idea of richness. And so this is that in and of itself is, involves two different considerations. It talks about the level of immediacy 
and the number of queues uh, available. So what do they mean by uh, immediacy? Uh, that's how quickly you can respond and give feedback. Uh, so if you, if you send somebody a, a traditional letter, you know, it's going to take at least a day, uh, maybe two or three days, or if it's overseas, sometimes weeks or even months for them to get the response, uh, for them to get your message and then respond, and it's going to take a, basically a long time to, to get back. Uh, same thing with uh, inter-office memos, right? They may only uh, circulate those once or twice, you know, maybe four or five times a day at a really busy office, uh, but still there's going to be a little bit of a lag there, uh, whereas, of course, with the uh, with an email, it's a little better, obviously. Uh, a text might be even faster. <laughs> and, of course, going to the office and, and a face-to-face -face meeting would be about as immediate as you can get. So that's just this first idea. You know, how important is it that you get a quick response and that you can get the feedback immediately? And this is a little bit more important than you might think. Uh, one of the things that I've read a lot about as an educator is about feedback on student essays. Or, or writing assignments and they've the research shows that the faster you can get the response back the feedback to the student the better it is if there's a long delay it's much less effective uh, pedagogically uh, so even if you're not writing you know copious notes and you're really just marking the heck out of an essay uh, which i discourage anyway uh, sometimes uh, having fewer comments but getting it back faster is is a better goal uh, so that's just immediacy uh, and then we also have uh, the control aspect of this, so that's just exactly what it sounds like. How much can you control this communication? How much control will you have over this? Uh, some of these communication channels, you can carefully plan out what it is you want to say. You, you can record it, uh, have a record of it, uh, versus uh, other <laughs> situations that might be very unpredictable. You know, think about any, anything can happen on a, on a phone call, uh, back and forth real quick. You know, it's not being recorded unless you're the CIA or something. Uh, so that's a very different communication channel in terms of control uh, than, say, an email or, uh, you know, some kind of a carefully coordinated back and forth uh, Q&A interview type situation. Uh, I run into control a lot sometimes with uh, doing my interviews for my YouTube channel. Uh, just recently, somebody was saying that uh, he didn't like the idea of just being recorded live. Uh, even though it's not streamed live. Uh, he wanted me just to, to write out my questions and then he would re record them on his end and send them to me. Uh, that way he'd have a lot of control over the the message. I mean, that didn't sound like much fun to me though, so I, I turned that down. <laughs> I like to have a little bit more control over it. Uh, I like for things to be a little bit more spontaneous, I guess, than to be that carefully uh, controlled. But in a business scenario, you know, that might be uh, effective. I could imagine somebody in the video interview for a job maybe saying that too. Like, I don't want to just be on on Skype in front of everybody. Uh, I want you just to send me the questions. I'll record responses, send them back to you. Uh, but the committee might object to that for similar reasons, right? Uh, planning, uh, again, just exactly what it sounds like. Uh, how much will you be able to draft, edit, revise, or hurt, <laughs> strategically develop something before the delivery? And you know, again, a face-to-face, -face, it's not that like you can't plan for a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, but it, a lot of times, I mean, you see this in the news happen all the time, right? Somebody be, uh, inter being interviewed, they get hit with a question they're not ready for, uh, they blurt something out, and the next thing you know, they're being uh, embarrassed, humiliated, <laughs> ashamed for it. Uh, you know, maybe the, sometimes it's, it's uh, you know, legitimate, I guess, but sometimes it's just, you know, they were just kind of speaking off the cuff. They probably were nervous. Uh, I think we, <laughs> I, I'm a little more sympathetic to that. <laughs> you know, somebody who's done public speaking, you, you just sometimes never know what's going to come out of your mouth. And then uh, you think, whoops. <laughs> uh, but yeah, sometimes, uh, again, I like an email because you can spend some time drafting, editing, revising it. Uh, you can read it out loud. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not doesn't have to be, you know, you probably shouldn't just instantly respond to something. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, and then the permanence, uh, this is the scary thing for a lot of us, right? The, you know, if you do email, if you do send a text, um, if, if, not to jump ahead at <laughs> the social media, you know, this could be stored somewhere and they could be, even if it seems like you deleted it, maybe they took a screenshot of it. You know, there's just all kinds of ways that this could be more permanent than you were aware of. 
Uh, but the degree it can be stored, and more importantly, the way it can be retrieved. Uh, so again, sometimes you think you deleted the email, uh, but maybe there's a way they can retrieve it. Maybe it went into a deleted folder. It wasn't permanently uh, deleted. And also some of these uh, companies have uh, uh, backups. Uh, so they might be storing all the emails somewhere and they could still go back, basically go back in time, <laughs> do an earlier version and uh, and get to it. Again, not trying to scare you, just saying if, if you're sending emails, don't count on uh, that being deleted ever. Uh, and also distributed to others, which kind of goes along with this, kind of a recurring theme here. Uh, you send an email to your friend, you think that you know the friend could be totally honest, totally value your privacy and your, your friendship and all this, but still you never quite know who else might be able to retrieve that message uh, or who else might see it, how it might get distributed. Uh, so these are the, you know, this is the classic reason sometimes if, if it's something sensitive, the managers or supervisors, they're hardly, they're hardly ever use email for that. Uh, that would be, <laughs> you know, unless they've, they're really new and they've never been burned like that. Uh, chances are they'll want to come talk to you face to face about it or use the phone uh, for precisely these reasons, right? They don't want this private message. It's only supposed to be for you uh, to get stored somewhere, retrieved and distributed. You know, though, on the other hand, sometimes you, you want to leave that paper trail uh, so you have a record of uh, the, the goings on. Uh, constraints, the practical limitations of uh, the coordination and resources. Uh, so there's some limitations on any of these mediums. And they just basically break this down into two categories, coordination of resources. Uh, the first one is the effort and timing needed to allow all the people to participate. And this this comes up a lot in my life with uh, people overseas when I'm trying to arrange interviews because uh, I do these interviews over Skype usually. And the problem is they might say, let's do the meeting. Here's my hours. I'm available at, from 9 to 11 o'clock a.m. I think, oh, wonderful, finally. <laughs> you know, I'll wake up, have my coffee, we'll do the interview. Uh, but then when I do the adjustments for the time zones, I might find, and this has happened several times, there might be as much as a 12-hour difference there. Uh, so I'm thinking 9 a.m., it's 9 p.m. Uh, or sometimes uh, the only time slots that work for them would be like, <laughs> for me, that would be 1 o'clock in the morning, let's say. Uh, so that can really have an impact. And it's, it's something you need to get used to thinking about is the timing. Uh, but even if it's, um, you know, sometimes we try to get together people to work on a Google document together, and we find even there uh, somebody's teaching at this slot, and that kind of overlaps with that person, and that person's here, and you know, it, it can take a lot of effort to coordinate all this. Uh, again, uh, with an email chain, it's a lot easier to coordinate usually uh, because people can just check that on their own time as opposed to, say, trying to get people together for a group of uh, phone calls, hard enough, uh, much less trying to get everybody into a room. Uh, that really takes a lot of coordination uh, to the point of uh, maybe somebody's flying people in, let's say, uh, for a job interview. A lot of coordination, for, <laughs> 10 times more coordination for that than it would be just to do a, uh, the group phone call, the conference call, or the, uh, you know, the Skype call. Uh, resources then. Uh, financial, space, time, other investments necessary to employ the particular channels uh, of communication. Uh, so the, uh, in this case, the group or the conference call is usually pretty easy. You know, most people have a phone. <laughs> uh, however, there might be some other factors at work there. You know, can they, do they have a quiet space even where they can make the phone call? Now, if you get into something like a Skype chat, well, that's you know a whole different ball game. There, they have to have a webcam. Uh, some type of, usually the webcam will have a, you know, a microphone built into it. Now, but that could be a factor. Again, how much time will it take to set all this up? How much would it, would it cost to get this going? Uh, so all of these factors will tie in. You know, maybe you have a great new, uh, was Adobe uh, Connect? <laughs> you think this is a great channel, sure. Uh, but if the person doesn't have it, are they going to be able to get this installed? And how, much, how long would that take? And will they need tech support for that? Uh, so there could be all sorts of uh, factors. Uh, here's just a simple uh, breakdown of, uh, I guess, a different way to think about business communication or a technological communication, whatever you want to call it. Just synchronous and asynchronous. And the way this comes up in my life is uh, with online classes. Some of the online classes will be synchronous 
and some will be asynch asynchronous. Now that just simply means uh, if it's synchronous, that means it's re happening in real time. Uh, so what happens is if the, even though it's online, they'll say everybody needs to be on D2L or in Adobe Connect, whatever the packages they're using. Uh, you need to be online at one to three o'clock, you know, Mondays and Wednesdays. <laughs> uh, so that, that's, you know, because stuff will be happening during those hours, real time. You know, it's more immediate that way. People are, there's probably a, a Q&A, maybe the teacher's there with a the webcam on uh, or doing a, an audio session with you and you can chime in. <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit more like a face-to-face you know, it's a little bit more like going to a classroom, right, where you you do have that ability to just raise your hand at any moment, uh, interrupt the uh, uh, the lecture. Now that's synchronous. Uh, and then the asynchronous, just the opposite. Right? It's not in real time, and the individuals involved can pay attention to respond to communications uh, at a time of their choosing. Uh, so this is obviously my preferred method. I like the asynchronous. You know, if, if you are a morning person, I'm a morning person. I'm not a night person. <laughs> I just, uh, sometimes I have to teach at night. I really dislike that. It's not, it's not Matt's peak time. <laughs> uh, but it might be yours, right? And I, that's, that's fine. So I like the asynchronous better because uh, this way, if you're, if you're watching this at 2 in the morning and that works for you, great. Uh, <laughs> it would not work for me. Uh, so that's just a quick breakdown there. So a, a just means not in this uh, situation. So asynchronous is not synchronous, and synchronous just means it's happening in, in real time. Uh, creating effective emails. Oh, boy. <laughs> One of my favorite topics. You know, I think there should be a whole class just on this, uh, really. just It's a real it's a real plague of the poor emails. And, and you know, I hear all the time uh, these you know, the businesses around here. They'll say, you know, what are, what are you folks teaching in your English classes? You know, we're getting these. Uh, we're hiring these uh, uh, Saint Cloud State grads, and they don't know how to write worth a damn. You know, geez, uh, you, you guys are really dropping the ball here. What's what's going on? And you know, when you dig a little bit deeper, what you find is it's, it's really not that they can't write. It's just that nobody's really talked to them about how to write a good email. Uh, so they're sending these emails to their bosses uh, where they're using all the, uh, you know, the, the, the text speak, <laughs> being way too informal. <laughs> uh, they're not using the, the deer. Uh, they're not, they don't have any, um, you know, sign off there at the bottom. Uh, it's just kind of very, it's almost like the same way they would email their buddies. Uh, they're, they're trying to email their supervisors and, and colleagues like that. So it creates a real break and it makes a poor impression. Uh, so again, I think that's why I think it's worth really fixating on this idea of what does a good email look like? And uh, to me, it's not really all that different from a traditional memo uh, or a letter. You know, I think that's what the uh, business folks are expecting is something more like that traditional memo, just in electronic form, not, uh, not a text. But anyway, uh, let's look at this. Uh, so most analysts expect it to be the primary tool for at least the next five to 10 years. So even though we have Skype and, and all this other video technology and texting, uh, they're still thinking email is going to stick around for a long time. That doesn't really surprise me. Again, it's basically just the letter or the memo, which those are around forever. It's basically just the electronic version of that. And to my mind, uh, there's nothing quite, you know, that really fills that same need. Uh, texting is great. Videos are great. Voice conferences are great, but those are very different channels. It's not quite satisfying that same need as the, as the email. All right, so here's the principles we'll be talking about. And we'll uh, take these one at a time, but uh, here's just a quick uh, overview of the topic. Uh, using it for the right purposes. When should you use email as opposed to all these other channels? Uh, how can you make it easy to read your email? Uh, what about the time? How can you show that you do respect the person's time? Uh, they've taken the time to open your email <laughs> and read your email. <laughs> you want to make sure they feel properly respected. Um, maybe they've got a lot of other stuff to do, but they're taking the time out to, to help you with your problem. So we want to make sure we show respect. Uh, protecting privacy and confidentiality, very big. Some companies, it's a bigger deal than others, but there's almost any company will have some concerns about 
uh, keeping private stuff private, <laughs> obviously keeping uh, customer information confidential. Uh, these can, you know, people have lost their jobs over this. Uh, responding promptly, uh, getting into a good habit. You know, when's it, how long do you want to let? How much time should go by before you respond? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, maintaining that professionalism, the appropriate level of formality. Again, this is the one that students get into trouble with on their <laughs> first day at the job. Uh, how to manage emotion effectively. And so it's not about not having emotion. You know, that's impossible. We're humans. We're not <laughs> robots. Uh, but when you do find yourself having that uh, strong emotions, how do you manage that productively, not, not let it control you? Uh, and then avoiding distractions. So all good stuff. Uh, so first of all, uh, when is the right time to send the email? What is the purpose <clears throat> or the right purpose for sending an email? And they point out a few things uh, using that language we talked about earlier. Uh, email does have few constraints, it's low cost, but most people have it. Uh, even if you don't have a computer at home or a phone, uh, usually people can go to the library, a public library or someplace, and, and get access to email. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of planning, a lot of setup. You know, you don't usually, I don't know about you, I don't usually call people and tell them, I'm about to send you an email. <laughs> you know, I just send it. It doesn't require any planning. Uh, any coordination on there on our ends uh, high control uh, exactly so you can you can think out what you want to say you can edit it and then it's going to be on a permanent record somewhere so archived and again even if you delete the email on your end uh, that doesn't mean it's gone uh, even if both people delete it it can still end up somewhere in some archive so it's rarely appropriate for sensitive or emotional communication tasks uh, so that's a big one. Uh, usually I say, if, you know, if, if somebody emails you back and they seem to be having the wrong response, if they seem more emotional or seem like you've offended them somehow unintentionally, the last thing you want to do is send another email trying to explain yourself. The channel has failed. Now that's the point where you got to pick up the phone and <laughs> go see them face to face. <laughs> you know, whatever it is, but don't keep using the uh, the broken channel. Uh, obviously, something has happened. There's it's no longer appropriate. Uh, but it pays to think ahead of time. You know, think about the. Are you giving somebody a message here that is sensitive? Is, is it likely to provoke them emotionally? If that's the case, uh, obviously a face to face. Uh, conversations better, a phone calls better. Okay, ensuring the ease of reading. A lot of good stuff here in, on this slide. Uh, so first, the, the subject line of the email. A lot of people m mess this up. They just put something like hello or important or have a problem, need help. Doesn't give me any information. And when you've got you know, 50 emails, you're really scanning those subject lines. You're looking for the subject lines uh, that you know you can get to, respond to quickly. Uh, so I like to think, you know, ideally that subject line tells me pretty much everything I need to know. Uh, so I can quickly see what that is, figure out my response, get it, you know, get it back to you quickly. Uh, whereas if it's just the help or important, you know, I might even uh, sometimes think that's just spam, not even uh, open it. You know, we're, that's another factor here is all, all the spam. Uh, this still gets through and a lot of those uh, spammers will just put something like important ex exclamation point <laughs> uh, so you kind of learn to you get, get into a habit of just ignoring that because uh, they're saying uh, using that over and over again uh, so any basically <laughs> the more descriptive you can be in that subject line the better uh, keep the message brief yet complete uh, most people don't like to open up an email and see four pages there uh, very annoying. Uh, long emails, uh, you, know, you just tend to skip it or scan, uh, scan it, skim it. Uh, if you can just get to the point right away, usually better off. But of course, don't leave out important info. Uh, identifying the expected actions. You know, this is another one that I don't know what the deal is, but uh, you always want to say, like, what do you want the reader to do? Like, what are you expecting here? Do you want a refund? Uh, do you want them to call you? <laughs> uh, do you want uh, uh, to verify that they've received something? You know, what is it? Uh, some people don't put this or they're vague about it. Uh, they don't really specify what it is they want. That's a, that's a big faux pas in a business communication, big problem. Uh, the business is, it should always be clear, like what is the purpose? What do you want them to do? 
uh, etc. A uh, descriptive signature block. Uh, so you, you know, again, a lot of people don't even have one. Uh, that's that's bad. Um, so you, at the very least, I would think you'd put your name on it. And you know, the signature block. What that's referring to is in, when your email app, uh, you can usually set it up so every email will have the same stuff at the bottom uh, every time. And a lot of people abuse the the heck out of this thing, putting all kinds of cute little quotes down there, or some. Uh, you know, silly legalese about how they're going to be uh, prosecuted if they forward this. You know, I, unless your company mandates something like that, I would not put that uh, kind of thing. I mean, you're not unless you're a lawyer, uh, which I doubt. Uh, but yeah, the, it does definitely helps to have a signature block with your name, job title, um, maybe a email address. Well, that's kind of redundant since it is an email. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe email address, phone, if you've got a whatever else you commonly use uh, just again the last thing you want is like a whole big beefy paragraph down there because that's going to just keep, keep getting sent and sent and copied and copied and it's going to make the email huge uh, i just put my name uh, use attachments wisely this kind of goes in the same category here uh, so maybe you got a newsletter that you want to send out to all the clients uh, you might want to think about it carefully Make sure that you've asked them beforehand if it's okay. <laughs> or maybe you have a little sign up, a little opt-in saying, do you want to receive these newsletters? Because uh, the PDF is, uh, might be 10 megabytes. Okay, that doesn't sound like much to you, but again, some of these people, they're paying a lot of money for their email, or at least a lot of money for them. Uh, maybe they don't just have unlimited storage and all these huge attachments are taking up space. I mean, much less a video, big audio file, uh, people don't usually want all that stuff cluttering up their their uh, uh, the storage. Ah, uh, yes, this is this is a good uh, good uh, table here. Time devoted to email by business professionals. And so I thought this was was fascinating. So I would have assumed that it was a lot more than just two to five hours. Actually, I was kind of surprised to see this. The, the 31.3 percent of these uh, business professionals say that they only spend about as little as two hours uh, checking email per day. Or, this is per week. <laughs> what? Yeah, I kind of kept thinking maybe they made some made an error on this. So time spent reading and writing email per week. And it says the majority of people say they only spend two hours or two to five hours. But even if it was the five hours, that just seems kind of weird to me. I guess they're spending almost all their time on the phone. Uh, again, I don't really know how this information was collected. Uh, I'm wondering if maybe they just, if this was wishful thinking on the part of these managers. <laughs> you know, like a lot of us don't have any conception of how long we stare at our uh, phones. Uh, but then when you get the uh, report, my phone, for whatever reason, has been sending me these uh, re screen reports. <laughs> it's like, did you know you spent, you know, 40 hours on your phone last week? You know, something scary like that. Uh, so th I'm really kind of questioning this. Uh, but anyway, I guess we can think about it. 11.2% did say they spend over 20 hours. Uh, I would imagine most people are probably... Actually, the lowest one, 16 to 20 hours, is what I would would have expected to be the highest. So I'm not really sure what to make of this. And I guess I could, uh, you know, get your take on it. Maybe you could talk about this here, <laughs> unless I forget to put the question, and then maybe at the end. But you know, I'd like to know about how much you figure you spend per week dealing with emails. Of course, this is managers, so maybe they are spending all their time, uh, you know, face-to-face -face interactions. Well, let's see. Figure 7.2. Less. Less effective email. So this is the bad email. Yep. <laughs> so look here. We've got uh, the subject, just agreement, very vague. No idea. We'll agree to what? What kind of agreement? Uh, I don't know. It's Who knows? <laughs> it's just a complete mystery. That's not a good sign. Uh, then we got an attachment. Uh, and the attachment is terms dot docx they say that's kind of non-descriptive terms of what you know i've got i've seen a lot worse than this you know i've seen something like just file uh, so this is usually a, a warning sign to me especially if it's uh, some kind of weird attachment uh, my first thought is this is probably a, a, some type of scam 
or spammer. And if I if I open this file, whatever it is, it might damage my computer. It might, uh, you know, it might be a hacker, uh, something like that. Uh, so I wouldn't even, you know, if you are going to put in a detachment there, it really needs to be clear what it is. Uh, let's get into the actual uh, body here. So you notice it's just one big chunk. They haven't done any formatting here. It's just a big paragraph. Let's see how long it takes us. Let's see how long it takes before we can figure out what the purpose of this email is. Let's see. Great to talk to you this morning. All right. Uh, so nice to hear about all your ideas for this event. I think you'll be really happy with how your sponsorship turns out. Now you'll be happy to know that the rate we negotiated for your sponsorship fee has been approved at thirteen thousand five hundred dollars. So that seems like that's kind of key information. But look, it's, look how long it took to get there, and it's kind of buried. Uh, in a weird place in this document. Uh, also, uh, we discussed the use of your logo. Uh, so here we have a new topic introduced. It's kind of a late, <laughs> I think we're just about in the middle here. We're getting a new topic. Uh, I can confirm that it will be placed on all guidebooks. So, I, you know, I, we don't need to go on here. I think you'll see uh, how badly organized that is. Uh, let's see what they're talking about here. Unhelpful signature block. Uh, so we have the name, we have the title, we have Better Horizons Credit Union. Uh, I guess the, we'll see what's unhelpful about that. I guess they, they don't give us any any other way to contact them. It'd be nice to have a phone number. And then we have the uh, unprofessional tagline. Uh, yeah, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Old smiley face, you know. <laughs> You know, it's kind of funny they're giving you all this advice, but I've seen professors on these uh, email lists all the time. And they'll have, oh, it won't just be one little quote like that. It'd be this lengthy excerpt from some novel or whatever. Uh, maybe a picture, <laughs> some kind of picture of a cat or something. Um, and that's just clogging up everything. And this gets, of course, when this they reply, this bit will get tagged into it. Next thing you know, you're having to really scroll until your finger hurts to try to get to the... Uh, uh, the, the meat of that. So hopefully we'll have a corrected version. Yeah, yeah, good, okay, good. So this is the more effective email. So I don't even have to read this. Just looking at it, just looking at it from a distance, even not even look. Don't, don't even look at the words. Just just kind of back up a little bit. And you just kind of look at that uh, from a distance and try to get a feel for just the the spatial organization of it, the design of it. It just looks nicer. We don't have these big chunks. We have to try to parse. Uh, here we've got nice, uh, a ni basically a bulleted list or a numbered list uh, that breaks it all down. A lot easier to get through this. Uh, they've got some bolding in here. Uh, so the I just kind of jumps to these uh, important parts. So sponsorship fee, $13,500. That's kind of, when I look at this email, that's the first thing I look at. Uh, even though this stuff appears first, for my eye just jumps here because this is uh, bolded and it's in a numbered list. Uh, so that's what I look at first. And then about, usually about after this, at this point, I would go back up here and look at this. Thank you for the call. Okay, nothing important there. Just kind of uh, friendly stuff. Please see the attached terms. Okay, so I kind of skip that. Go back to here. Uh, your logo will be placed in all guidebooks. Okay, that's good. And I like here how they're giving me, uh, they're referring to parts of this uh, attachment. So that's letting me know kind of like what's in the attachment or why, why should I look at that attachment? Oh, well, that's, you know, the pricing sections there, sponsorship benefits on page three are good. Uh, the booth details are there for my booth, booth size. Uh, so, I mean, to me, this kind of speaks for itself. It's a lot better organized and it really kind of shows me that they respect my time enough to make this so easy to read. Uh, they're not trying to pull one over on me by burying information deep inside the document somewhere. No, it's, it's all very clear. Uh, very, it's not, doesn't feel shouty. <laughs> it doesn't like they've uh, used all caps or anything. It's just polite. It's professional. Looks good. You know, I think anybody would be happy to get this sort of email. Uh, a pleasant closing. Uh, let's see what they say there. Uh, we appreciate your sponsorship. Nice. <laughs> we have two staff members dedicated to assisting platinum sponsors. Blah blah blah. Uh, two days prior to the event, you will see you will receive contact information for these staff members. Good. So they kind of headed off an obvious question there, and they don't. They probably don't want to get emails saying when uh, the, when are we going to get the contact info for the staff members. <laughs> 
Well, no, they put it here so they don't have to go to all those questions. And then we got, let's see what's so much better here. Complete professional signature line. Uh, so they gotten rid of the quote, and instead we have uh, the contact info. So got an office phone, a mobile phone, and an email there. Oof, that's a quite a bit better. You know, this is a, a really nice email. Now the only thing about it, I, I <laughs> you know, I kind of wonder if it's just saying hi, Stephanie. You know, I would assume they've already got a relationship and they're already friendly with each other. Uh, otherwise, I think it'd be more appropriate to put uh, dear uh, and then the you know appropriate uh, salutation there, whatever their last name is. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Showing respect for other people's showing respect for others time <laughs> other people's time uh, select the message recipients carefully oh yeah you know so you don't want to just uh, <laughs> it just oh my god you know it just it, it bugs the fire out of me to to get all these useless emails just cluttering up my box and you know half the time it's just people have responded to these lists you know somebody will send out an email to the entire department and somebody else will reply to everybody on the list, and suddenly that's just cluttering up your inbox, just junk. Why can't they just put reply and just reply to the person <laughs> that it pertains to? <laughs> and I think that the classic example is when somebody uh, gets this and they'll say, please take me off your list. And then uh, that, please take me off your list, will get sent to everybody. And then the person who's responding will say, okay, I've taken you off the list. And then that gets sent to everybody. It's just junk. You know, it really shows, uh, you know, I don't think the people are being, I, I don't want to say they're just ignorant, but you know, they haven't really thought about uh, <laughs> who's receiving the message. That doesn't need to go out to everybody. Uh, that just needs to go to the person uh, that controls the email list. Uh, so that's the first one. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to, leave out somebody that does need to be on that email you know so if you're part of a committee uh, you want to make sure if it's committee business that everybody on the committee gets it uh, not just your friend on the committee now uh, providing timelines and options you know another good good idea you know how long is this going to take <laughs> what are my options uh, be careful about using the priority flag oh. Yeah, this is another one. You know, if you're the manager, that's one thing. But if you're sending something to the manager, you know, I've gotten emails from students before where they're not only are you not only are they using this priority flag like important. You, know, you might you might not even know what that is, and that might be a good thing. <laughs> uh, but sometimes you can flag an email as important or urgent or something. And so I'm getting this uh, email from a student with that urgent flag, and then they might even go a step further and have that silly thing where it's, it says uh, acknowledgement. So once I open the email, then it sends them an email saying I've opened it. <laughs> and I, I'm starting to think, man, is this what's going on here? Is the person trying to sue me? You know, are they trying to get uh, legal apparatus involved here? What, what is up with this? And then you look at the email, and it's just some, something like, uh, <laughs> I missed class on Monday. What what I miss? <laughs> or uh, I missed the quiz. When can I make up the quiz? And it's kind of a little bit offensive, right? Because they, they've set all this up like it's some big urgent emergency and you don't know what's going on. And then you look at it and figure out it's just nothing. Uh, they should have just waited and talked about it. That's not even an appropriate channel for that. Uh, and that's something they should have talked about in class, right? Or after class or something. And then they, you know, they dug the hole deeper with all this priority business. And so anyway, be careful with that. And again, it's, it's, you don't want them to think it's spam. And the spammers, this is exactly this kind of stuff they do, right? They make it look like it's some kind of big, important emergency. You know, your account may have been hacked, uh, top pro, you know, all this stuff. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> delete. Uh, let others know you will take longer than anticipated to respond or take action. You know, this is, this is what I was talking about before, right? So if you need a little time to think about it, that's fine. But just let them know. I'll get back to you. And then just make a point of actually getting back to them. Now, avoid contributing to confusing and repetitive email chains. All right, so this is exactly what I was talking about up here. You don't want to just 
make this huge email chain even longer. I don't even like, I don't know anybody that likes getting these huge email chains. Uh, a lot of times you're better off just starting a new one instead of just keep adding on to this uh, long chain with like seven different topics going. And some of the people are talking to this group and some of these other people are talking to that group. It's just a big mess. Come on. Uh, it doesn't cost anything just to get rid of this and start up a new uh, a new email. Let's see. Use of email greetings and names in a low morale and a high morale organization. So what's this about? It says a uh, researcher was given access to the emails in two organizations. Uh, one was low morale, one was high morale. She found that the presence or absence of greetings and names at the beginning of email was a strong indicator of company climate. Ah, so that is very interesting. Uh, so look at this. So, you know, a lot of you folks will go on, hopefully, to some kind of professional communications job, uh, or at least using these skills uh, at your company. So think about this. So if that company, obviously the high morale organization will get more done than the low morale, I and mean, that should go without saying, uh, but just something as simple as putting the people's uh, person's name, you know, in the email. Uh, so think about this as a student, right? Uh, if you email me something, you know, dear Dr. Barton, blah, 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 and then I reply to you and I, I say, oh, well, thank you, Tim. <laughs> thank you, uh, uh, Jenny or whoever. Uh, people like that, to see their name there. I think they quoted that in the book, that old quotation from Carnegie about their, the sweetest music to anyone's ear is the sound of their own name. <laughs> you know, people like that. They don't want, hey, uh, hey, you. Or <laughs> no greeting at all. <laughs> no, it's nice for them to see you know their name. You're you're greeting them. Uh, you don't you don't want to overdo it. <laughs> Dear exalted one. Uh, you know, don't be silly with it. But yet, you know, dear Doctor Barton, hi, how's it going? Or dear Doctor Barton, uh, nice to talk to you. <laughs> Just something quick, a little greeting. Uh, it sounds like it's nothing, but it actually, as you can see here. Look at the difference. I mean, just look at the difference. So a greeting, greeting word plus a name. Hi, Dr. Burton. That leads to this high morale organization, just something that simple. Whereas just <laughs> Barton <laughs> or hi or nothing. Uh, so really think about this when you're sending emails. Uh, you know, did you say uh, dear in their name, hi or hi, blah, blah, blah. And it's being a little bit friendly, taking the time to put the name in there uh, goes a long way. All right, let's see what else we have here. Uh, professionalism and appropriate levels of uh, formality. All right. Uh, so avoid indications you view email as a casual <laughs> communication. All uh, right, because we talked about this already. Uh, the company, somebody that's been there, the manager, the supervisor, hopefully they know these emails are being archived and collected. It is part of the company record. Um, this is basically documentation. Uh, so they want to make sure you're not just putting uh, ridiculous stuff into an email, uh, that you're taking uh, taking it seriously, because this could come back not just to bite you, uh, but affect the whole company. Uh, so they really want to see, are you being professional with these email, with these uh, emails? Uh, let's see, apply the same standards of spelling, punctuation, and formatting you would for other written documents. You know, this is a... You know, obviously, if you know somebody well, you've been at the company a long time. Uh, you have a good sense of the culture there. Maybe it's not a culture where they really stress this stuff. Uh, on the other hand, maybe they are very serious about it. Uh, so, again, if you don't know, if you're new there, uh, always assume they do care about it. Because uh, it's it's fine to be a little... <laughs> nobody's going to jump on you for spelling things correctly and taking the time to punctuate correctly. Uh, that's a much... You know, somebody might say, oh, wow, look, this person's very pedantic. Uh, you think you're still in school or something? I mean, maybe that, that's kind of easy to deal with that. Uh, on the other hand, it's a lot more serious if you send something out that's poorly punctuated, and badly spelled, and then you get, uh, you know, people get the impression that you're not well educated or you're not proofreading, you're not taking it seriously. <laughs> that's a lot more serious problem to me uh, than somebody thinking, wow, you're a little bit too formal. Or, wow, you're really nerdy. You know, I'd rather have that reputation uh, than the opposite. Uh, use the greetings and the names. So this is, we just talked about this, and even though I hammer on this in my 332 class, 
to the point of pain. <laughs> like don't just never put the whom it may concern. That doesn't concern anybody. That is instant deletion. It's like getting a letter in the mail that says uh, to current resident. Whoosh, don't even open the envelope. Just whoosh, right into the garbage. Uh, if they can't even be bothered to <laughs> figure out what my name is <laughs> and show a little bit of, you know, uh, greetings there, uh, hi, blah, 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 uh, then why should I even care? That's, it's not just informal. It's not just, about, it's really about more than professionalism and formality. It's, it's about effectiveness. Yeah, that, that's ineffective. All right, let's see, managing emotion and maintaining civility. All right, so we, yeah, we've really been seeing this a lot in the news uh, lately. Uh, you know, emotion, and we talked about it too earlier, the, the importance of emotional intelligence, your, your EQ. You know, it's not like this stuff is just frivolous and, and we shouldn't care about emotion and the only thing that matters is, is the information. You know, we're finding that's actually not true at all, uh, that we really want to think a lot about emotion and emotional intelligence is just as critical if not more so, a lot of communication situations than just to having the facts right. Uh, so there's a couple of effects. Uh, the neutrality effect. Uh, recipients are more likely to perceive messages with an intended, intended positive emotion as neutral. Uh, so what, what does that mean? Uh, so you may wish to express enthusiasm about something, but the re receiver decodes the message without hearing the enthusiasm. Uh, so they might think it's a negative or a negative. <laughs> that's the neutrality effect. So one of the problems, I guess, the, with an email, it's kind of harder to detect uh, authentic uh, positive emotion. I guess that's just kind of the nature of the, of the medium, right? They don't hear the tone of your voice, for example. So that's the neutrality effect. Uh, the negativity effect is a recipient's more likely to perceive messages that are intended as neutral as being negative. And again, this has to do with not being able to hear the, the tone of your voice. Uh, so th this is probably more common to me, the negativity effect. Uh, so you write an email, it's just neutral. <laughs> it's nothing negative. Uh, but again, they can't see your face. They can't see uh, the, <laughs> they can't see your, uh, hear the tone of your voice. Uh, so they uh, have a tendency to perceive it negatively. Uh, so think about this. Basically, either one of these, these effects are uh, the emotions are going in places you didn't intend them to go. Uh, so you had a positive emotion, you're trying to express positivity, that comes across as not caring or apathetic or neutral. That's the neutrality effect. Uh, on the other hand, if you do want something just to be neutral, uh, sometimes that can come across as uh, negative. Uh, so that, this is interesting to think about. You kind of have to, if, so if you're sending email, basically think about it. The, whatever the positive is will be neutral. Whatever the ne neutral is might even be negative. Uh, let's see, flames and cyber silence. Uh, so <laughs> flames or flame wars or bullying, whatever uh, the term is you want to use for this. Uh, basically, emails with hostile intentions characterized by words of profanity, obscenity, and insults that inflict harm to a person or, or an organization. Uh, so I don't, uh, thankfully, I haven't really <laughs> seen this happening uh, in my workplace, but obviously it does happen in lots of workplaces. Again, you should never send emails, any kind of, you really shouldn't do any business communication whatsoever if you're uh, extremely angry, because you might lead, might lead to these things, right? And if you cuss somebody out, curse somebody on an email, well, that's now become part of that public record. It can probably come back, again, not just to harm you and that person, but the whole organization. So really, this kind of stuff should never be happening anyway. Uh, so there's that. But sadly, <laughs> you know, I'm sure we've all seen a flame war happening at some point. And then the cyber silence, non-response to emails or uh, other communications. Uh, so this is, uh, to me, I think the... <laughs> Uh, I think a not, uh, I'd rather not respond to something uh, than to jump in, you know, join the fray, uh, as it were, or somebody if there's a bunch of cursing, you know, I just tend to not get involved in that. Uh, but they could send a message too, right? If, uh, you know, people can kind of pick up eventually, like this person's not responding to anything. Uh, they seem to be mad at us. <laughs> you know, what do we do? <laughs> uh, so that's kind of considered not civil either. 
Like, you know, if, you, if you've got a problem, what is the problem, right? What's happening? Uh, so it might just be you're not, a, you haven't been getting the emails or whatever it is, but the point is it could be pursued, it could be perceived as disrespectful or uh, uncivil. Uh, cyber incivility, uh, the violation of respect and consideration in an online environment based on workplace norms. And they kind of break this into uh, active incivility or passive incivility. So this is, you know, a lot of these studies, you know, show that people feel like they have been uh, disrespected or people have been uh, uncivil to them in, a, in an online environment, uh, an email, let's say. Uh, you don't really see it too much face to face, <laughs> again, because you don't have those two effects going, neutrality and negativity. Uh, so some of this, you know, it could be mis miscommunication, but there are cases uh, where it can be avoided. That's All right, so here's what they're talking about with the active versus passive incivility. And this is from a study of uh, employees stated that the current supervisor had engaged in email incivility. So what they were trying to do is look at male supervisors and female supervisors and see if there was a, you know, a difference, a significant difference in the way or the types of incivility uh, they engage in, or at least are perceived <laughs> to have engaged in. Uh, so let's look at the active email. So some kind of a direct affront. So said something hurtful to you through emails. So only 22% said that a female supervisor had done that, but 60% of the uh, male supervisors had. Uh, same thing with demeaning or derogatory remarks use emails to say negative things about you they wouldn't say face to face put you down or was condescending condescending to you in some way through email uh, so in all of these uh, categories the the males are a lot more likely to do that than the females and i think this is you know i was thinking about this trying to think about some of my <laughs> less civil emails i've <laughs> received over the years <laughs> and i've definitely noticed this one here so it seems like a lot of the times uh, it will be a male student. Uh, they get upset about something. They can't figure out an assignment or they're upset at a group member or whatever. Uh, they get flustered, basically, they emotionally hijacked. They, so they send me this extremely uh, angry email saying all kinds of things. You know, they would never say. But what happens is they stop coming to class after that. You know, so they send me this really rude email, but then they, I guess they're embarrassed about it, uh, so they don't come back. Uh, so that's a definitely seems to be an issue. You know, again, <laughs> this why is they don't ever email somebody if you're kind of, uh, you know, if you're really upset and angry, just let some time go by. If you're still angry about it the next day, there's probably a good reason to, to be angry. Uh, but if the next day you might say, you know what, geez, why was I so upset about it? You know, it was nothing. You know, it was ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Give yourself a chance to cool off is uh, my advice. Let's see. Uh, so that's the, the, the male supervisors. The female supervisors, though, are a lot more likely to engage in uh, what they call passive email incivility. And so what does that look like? So they're just not replying at all. Uh, so they're upset. or uh, <laughs> You're trying to send them some email. They're not responding to you. You're getting upset about it. You're like, geez, I sent this, you know, it's two days ago. I haven't heard from you. It's now it's a week. <laughs> you send another email, no response to that either. Uh, nobody likes that routine. Uh, did not acknowledge receipt of your emails. They're just ignoring it, I suppose. Uh, using emails for discussion that would require face-to-face uh, -face dialogue. You know, again, I'm thinking about this one's probably the one I've noticed more often than not. You know, so if it is something like a it's a kind of grade related matter, something that, you know, shouldn't be <laughs> sent over email. This, this, this needs to be kept confidential. This, is, this should be private information. Uh, it tends to get, you know, maybe they, they don't want to come in and talk about it face to face for whatever reason. Uh, so they uh, keep using the emails, even though I'm saying this is not really appropriate, you know, for email. <laughs> so I have noticed that a little bit, uh, maybe not to the degree here. I mean, this is just kind of shocking. Uh, used email for time sensitive messages. You know, I haven't. I don't know if I've seen that happen, but uh, I suppose so. So anyway, they're basically saying the study anyway is saying that there's really a marked difference between the types of incivility 
uh, between the male and the female supervisors. So something to think about. Here's some more about managing emotion, maintaining civility. Uh, so the reinterpretation is one that I have uh, come to value a lot. Uh, so what, what is that? This, so you get this email, maybe you have this sort of knee-jerk reaction to it, it makes you upset, uh, you get mad about it, uh, uh, you have some kind of reaction to it. Uh, so the key is to reinterpret it. So adjust your initial perceptions uh, by making more objective, more fact-based, and less personal judgments and evaluations. And let me tell you, this <laughs> this is this will save you a lot of embarrassment, if not your job, uh, if you can get used to doing this. Uh, so you get the email, you take it personally. Uh, see if there's some way you can reinterpret what happened. Uh, so sometimes I get this, it's not really an email. Well, maybe with an email, like I said, sometimes I get the email. It seems like it's very offensive. It seems angry and uh, Maybe they're being really harsh and all this stuff. So my, my first instinct might be, God, what, you know, what, a, what an idiot! You know, how, how could this person possibly uh, send their professor this message? You know, this person must want to fail, <laughs> or whatever. You know, just this, this sort of stuff comes to mind, and you get kind of upset about it. Uh, maybe though, you could reinterpret it a little bit. Again, stepping back and saying, well, maybe they got really flustered. Who knows what else they've got going on at home? Maybe they're just really stressed out. Uh, you know, maybe the instructions are unclear. Uh, you know, all, and then they think, well, I am a teacher. You know, this is a teachable moment. <laughs> so, all kinds of ways to reinterpret that uh, that will really be a lot more productive than just, uh, you know, that initial response. Uh, less personal judgments and evaluations. All right, so this might not, not have been a personal thing, I guess, is kind of the key. Uh, relaxation, you know, releasing and overcoming anger and frustration so you can make a more rational, less emotional response. Yeah, again, this one's huge. Um, a lot of times, it's kind of tough in Minnesota, I think, with these extreme winters. Uh, that, but you know, if it's not if it's not 12 below, <laughs> you know, I always find it nice, especially if you're kind of getting worked up, you're frustrated, you're angry. Uh, you don't want to keep emailing in that situation. You want to go out, go for a little walk. Uh, again, if it is 12 below zero, something like that, maybe it's just a walk around the hallway. <laughs> uh, maybe it's just uh, taking a little time out, uh, you know, listen to a piece of music, uh, you know, do a little meditation even, you know, whatever it is you like. Uh, but just try to calm down some uh, before you respond. And then the diffusing, uh, avoiding escalating, this is probably the big thing. You don't want to make the situation worse, right? You don't want to escalate. And so what can you do? Remove tension to focus on the uh, work objectives. Uh, so focus on the, the task at hand in your reply. Uh, focus on the shared objectives and what you agree on. Express interest in arranging a time uh, to meet in person uh, to discuss it. So those are all ways to kind of take some of the, some of the heat off of this uh, diffusing. There's a whole, you know, basically there's a whole field dedicated to this, right? Conflict resolution. Uh, some of you have um, told me that you're interested in that. You probably know more about it than I do. Uh, but, you know, this advice seems pretty sound. So let's look at the less effective response to an angry email. Uh, so let's see if we could find the uh, original email. It's down here. Uh, Anis, the other day when we discussed the new website, you didn't give me a chance to explain my ideas, and I don't think you made the conversation fair. I tried to explain that your goal of attracting younger customers is good, but we need to create a more interactive website that's plugged into social media if we're going to make this happen. You seem to just want the easiest, quickest solution. Before we start developing the site anymore, let's meet and change things up a bit. Jacqueline. So they say that's you know, rightfully so. It's accusatory. Jacqueline blames uh, Hanese in every regard. Uh, the use of the you voice increases the accusatory tone. So you seem to just want the easiest, quickest solution. Well, that's nobody's going to read that and get happy about it, right? It's it's not. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's angry. Uh, but let's see their response to it. This is the ineffective or less effective response to something like that. Uh, we need to talk about this email when I get back in a week after the holiday. Right? We need to talk. 
Uh, I hate this is probably some of the <laughs> some of the most unpleasant words in the English language, right? We need to talk, and especially when there's going to be a delay, because you know the whole time the person's going to be sweating, like, oh my goodness, what do we, what does this mean? We need to talk. It's like the teacher, <laughs> I need to see you after class. You know, even if that turns out to be a good thing, maybe it's, yeah, I wanted to mention <laughs> you're going to get the scholarship. <laughs> I want to tell you I'm nominating you for a scholarship. You don't know that. Uh, all you hear is that I need to see you after class. So all this horrible stuff starts uh, percolating in your brain, right? Uh, but moving on. Uh, I thought we had a productive conversation, but you obviously were not can candid or professional. Ugh, <laughs> you, you were unprofessional. Also, please empty your voicemail. <sighs> I tried reaching you several times only to get your full voice mailbox, complaining, confronting, and yeah, impersonal, there's no name up there. So just about everything you could do to ask, this is just going to escalate the situation. It's going to make that face-to-face -face meeting, if it, if it happens, uh, a lot more intimidating, a lot less pleasant. Uh, so let's look at a little bit better response. Uh, hello, Jacqueline. <laughs> Come on. A In, little uh, informal, informal, but I guess that's okay. I'm sorry to hear that you do not think our conversation was fair. I'm glad you're thinking about how we can use the website to better attract younger customers. Uh, so they say there's more cordiality, more personal, validating, compliments Jacqueline on her desire to improve the website. Uh, moving on, we're both back in the office. Let's set up a time to discuss plans for the website. Would you be willing to come up with your three major ideas, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so you can hear already there's... There's not that defensive tone. It's more inviting. Uh, let's see, did they mention anything in here about the full uh, voicemail box? No, I don't even see anything in here about your email box. Your voicemail box was full. <laughs> Nothing like that here. Uh, and something else I noticed too. There's more questions here. They're kind of putting it back on them and you know showing that they've thought about what they're saying. And, but yeah, I, I don't think you need me to sit here and explain why this is more effective. I think that would go a lot long, a long ways towards diffusing that. And the person might even say, you know what, I'm kind of, I'm sorry I sent off that angry email. You know, I just really was kind of upset, uh, but now I feel a lot better. And, you know, the meeting is going to be a lot more productive. You know, that's basically what uh, the important thing is. You're not just going to show up and start shouting at each other. Uh, instant messaging in the workplace. Uh, so moving from email now into the uh, instant messaging realm and texting, in other words, uh, it's a relatively new and undeveloped form of communication in the workplace and attitudes towards it vary significantly. Uh, many professionals consider it impersonal, uninteresting, rude, intrusive, or inadequate. So that's kind of interesting. But yeah, I guess people don't, uh, you know, if they see you sitting at your desk with your phone in your hand, instant messaging, uh, they might, uh, you know, have this kind of response. And a lot of people don't like <laughs> getting the texts <laughs> uh, for various reasons. I think intrusive, and that's probably the big thing. I mean, I wouldn't want my uh, supervisors or deans uh, texting me about work-related stuff, <laughs> just me. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, all these other stuff can come into play, too. Obviously not as uh, – it can seem impersonal compared to a face-to-face -face meeting. And you do get – you see the memes all the time, somebody breaking up with somebody using a text. Uh, you know, that's inappropriate <laughs> for obvious reasons. Uh, it's a lot of this stuff just, just the same idea as that but applied to the workplace. Uh, now, the meta message of instant messaging. So what is – thinking about it almost like a McLuhan – McLuhan-esque way. The medium is the message. <laughs> what does it mean to send an instant message instead of an email? You know, what, what are some of the connotations of that? Uh, is it appropriate? Uh, use an instant message for simple and brief conversations, uh, not for important decisions. So again, I kind of think about this as a step between a phone call and, a, and an email, a little bit uh, somewhere in between those. Uh, make sure your tone is positive, supportive, and appropriately fun. So if you and your managers and your colleagues have this, again, if the culture there is to kind of use the emoticons and the emotes uh, to joke around in the instant messaging, uh, you know, wait until you see evidence of that before you do it. Uh, don't leap in and think that's the norm because you might be surprised. 
Now, don't ask questions you can get answers to yourself. You know, that's always annoying. Uh, be careful about abbreviated language, emoticons, acronyms, and emoji. Yeah, you know, one of the weirdest things, if you have a, you know, if you have an Apple phone, and the other person has a uh, Android phone or a Windows phone or whatever it is, uh, they might not be able to see these emojis. You know, this has happened to me several times. You know, somebody will just say, you know, whatever that was, I didn't get it. Uh, so that's kind of annoying. So there might be a reason not not to use that. Uh, you know, whatever that little animation is, the little smiley face, whatever. Maybe it doesn't even show up. And they might not understand the acronym, and then you have to waste some more time. And you know what? I have seen people even get upset about sending an instant message, especially if it is a text, because uh, some people, believe it or not, are still paying per text. And, you know, I've gotten, a, I've gotten an email from somebody one time that says, you know, you cost me a dollar and ten cents with your text. You know, please use email instead. And of course, <laughs> my response is like, like, what? Really? Really? Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, I don't think that person did themselves any favors with that. Uh, but, you know, I did show I didn't really evaluate the context, the meta message of the instant messaging. Clearly, that person didn't want me texting. I didn't get it. <laughs> Had to be told. And that's never the situation you want to be in. Now, let's see. Instant messages to uh, show support. Uh, so here we have Jacqueline. Uh, great presentation to our sponsors, Hanis. Count me in to help with tech support in any way. Thanks, Jacqueline, for helping me set up all the computer equipment today. I couldn't have done it without you. And then there's a smiley face. And that seems that's this seems perfectly okay to me. I mean, these, these are not exactly formal, professional sounding, but they they are punctuated correctly. <laughs> you know, I don't think anybody would have any issues with these attack or instant messages. Let's see a little bit more on this. Uh, avoiding the sarcasm and the jokes in most cases, right? The, that's how many how many times do people get in trouble with that? It's kind of hard to read, basically like an email. It's kind of hard to hear the tone sometimes of a joke or sarcasm. Uh, they might take it seriously, literally. Uh, rescheduling the meeting times or places, you know, this is <laughs> that can certainly be annoying. <laughs> you know, somebody has traveled to this meeting. And now, uh, 10 minutes before the meeting, you're texting them to say, oh, it's actually been uh, postponed. Well, that's that's annoying. Uh, so you consider turning off the sound alerts for incoming messages. Yeah, Nobody likes that. Uh, be in a meeting and it's constituted, you know, or <laughs> ding, ding. You know, nobody wants that. Uh, identify yourself. Oh, my God. This one. <laughs> this one. Oh, I can't stand, you know, I get this all the time. Uh, the text just say, uh, hey, please call me or something. I won't say who it is or what it is. And my first instinct always is to think, well, it's, a, it's a, some kind of telemarketer, scammer. I'm not going to text that. I'm not even going to text back and say, who is this? <laughs> hey, really, that should be your first thing. Hi, this is Joe. Uh, maybe even the last name with a name like that. Um, that should be the first item. Uh, clearly in the IM exchange, right? Um, <laughs> bye for now. <laughs> no response required. Uh, avoid the personal IMs. That should go without saying. Uh, avoid send, sending instant messages after work hours. That's another annoying thing. You know, depending on the job. I mean, some jobs, they, you are kind of expected to be on call all the time, but most people get annoyed by this. Uh, establish rules with your colleagues for instant messaging uh, during the meetings. All right, so this a lot of times can be perceived as the height of rudeness and disrespect. Uh, you know, as a teacher in, a, in front of a classroom, the last thing you want to do is look out there and see that <laughs> all those folks over there are just texting, you know, much less at a meeting. But you do see this even with professors at these, uh, you know, professional meetings. Sometimes one of them will, you know, ding! pull out their phone, they're sending a response, and everybody's looking at them, just, you know, <laughs> the daggers, <laughs> daggers in their eyes at this person. You know, clearly they are violating some rules, but maybe they didn't think there was anything wrong with this. Nobody's ever said anything to them about it. Uh, it wasn't made clear. You know, it could be that the, instead of calling this person out and shaming them in front of everybody, though, uh, what you'd want to do is just maybe at the, the next meeting, 
and I kind of make a general uh, rule about this and, and not make it about this this person. All right, <laughs> yeah, this, I like this one here. The mismatched messaging styles. Now, so look and see what, what's going on here. So Jacqueline writes, I just got reservations for a 7 p.m. meeting at Roscoe's Teriyaki Bar. It's located at 714 Main Street. <laughs> and then on these right here, it's great, GR8, the numeral, THX, thanks. Uh, at least I uh, put a period there. <laughs> okay, so maybe Hanese is signaling here. Look, we don't need to be this formal. You know, we can use this uh, more fun way to communicate. That's okay with me. But then Jacqueline writes back, we have to cancel the meeting. Christine just called and said she has some other plans. So, so clearly she's not adapting. She doesn't want to adapt. Uh, but instead of taking that cue, uh, Hanese just keeps up with the, <laughs> the, the uh, text speak. Uh, so clearly this is mismatched. Either Haniz needs to, uh, you know, adopt the more formal style uh, or vice versa. Again, I, I think Haniz, though, would probably be the one that would want to change in the circumstance. And then the, let's see, what is this? Potentially effective instant message in a meeting. Uh, do you want to bring up the issue of tech support at the literacy fair? I'm not clear about which staff members will be involved. Uh, good idea. I'll raise the issue in a few minutes. Or, so this might be a little group, a little group chat going on. You know, maybe somebody's speaking. Uh, some of the other panel members are down there. Some of the other employees at the company. Uh, so they might want to text. You know, if it's something that <laughs> you don't want to raise your hand and uh, bring this to the attention of everybody, or you maybe you're not in a position to pass a just pass a note to them, uh, which would probably be the best strategy. Uh, this, you know, you could do the text. Just hopefully their phone will go ding. <laughs> Let's see. An ineffective instant message in a meeting. <laughs> totally OT. Uh, totally off topic. When will this, <laughs> when will this meeting end? <laughs> oh, you know how talkative CR is, frowny face. Well, again, yeah, this is ineffective. Maybe this is going to get back to CR for one thing. Uh, this is not productive, obviously. Again, the, the complaining, the negativity, usually it's you're a lot better off just keeping that to yourself. Uh, the last thing you want to do is put it on the public record and put it in the archive. All right, managing digital communication efficiently. I think these are all good tips here. Uh, so try to get in the habit of just four or five times a day at designated times. Uh, so you might say, I'll check it when I get into work. I'll check it again uh, before lunch. I'll check it again after lunch, and I'll check it again uh, before, you know, about an hour before I leave. You know, so that'd be good. You don't just be on it all the time. Uh, wean yourself off checking your mobile devices constantly. You know, I see this. Some people are to the point now where they have to have it out. You know, they have to have it there on the desk so they can see, see those texts coming in. Uh, they can't even turn it off for, you know, half hour or hour long meeting. Uh, that's not good. Uh, you don't want to get addicted to your mobile device, which I think is a kind of a big concern for a lot of us. So if you get in the habit of just, you know, it's lunchtime, I'm just going to leave the, the phone in my drawer, drawer <laughs> and, and stay, get away from it for a while, uh, that's good. Or this meeting, I'm just going to leave the phone behind because I know I'll be too tempted to take it out and look at it uh, during the meeting. Uh, if that's going to be a problem for you, just leave it in your desk, and then you won't have to, you won't have that uh, that worry. Uh, develop strategies to manage the inbox. Again, this can be a big thing. You know, see if you can get better clearing that out quickly. Uh, turning off the message alerts. Yeah, you don't want the ding, 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 ding all during the <laughs> meeting. <laughs> it should look like a ding dong. Uh, use rich channels, uh, such as face-to-face -face phone conversations to accomplish a task uh, completely. That's uh, always good advice. Reply immediately only to the urgent messages. Yes, this is good. Good tips. Uh, avoid unnecessarily lengthening an email chain. We talked about that. Uh, use automatic messages to let people know when you're unavailable. So that's one of the things that got made fun of in that video. But you know, it is a good idea. If you know you're going to be away for a week, uh, you don't want people emailing you and feeling like, why this person must hate my guts. Uh, he's not responding. And so you had the little reminder there. The email they received basically says, I'll be out of the office uh, over the next week. <laughs> yada, yada. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Schedule and plan your phone calls. Uh, yes. Um, 
a lot of people we're not really in that space anymore where people like just get their phone rings they don't know who it is uh, they probably won't even pick up if they if they don't know who it is and people like me i don't like just getting a call out of the blue kind of just interrupts my whole day I'm flustered i <laughs> kind of just uh you know confuses me it kind of disorients me it's much better if somebody says look i need to I something to talk about i need to talk to you about the project blah 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 uh i'll call you is it okay to call you tomorrow during your office hours let's say one o'clock and that's great then i can expect the call everything's fine no problem uh, ensure the quality audio uh, <laughs> yeah sometimes this isn't under your control you know if you're out of range of your phone sometimes that could be a problem but to the extent that you can uh, do that uh, open with a warm greeting use your caller's name uh, I think most of us are in the habit of doing this anyway you know hi, hi Dr. Martin oh hi Jim <laughs> after a brief small chat uh, direct the conversation to the issues at hand right always a good a little bit of chit chat uh, before you jump into the business I mean part of this is social right I mean, you, you don't want to just strictly have this uh, uh, business relationship because really business and social kind of go together in a lot of ways uh, speak with a pleasant enthusiastic voice some other things I share conversation time equally uh, another big one you know so many people especially somebody really extroverted they're, they're kind of used to just filling in all the gaps whenever there's a pause and they'll just keep going and going and going and you know you're kind of sitting there waiting like when are they gonna when are they going to take a breath so I can respond and they just keep going and you're like geez Louise come on uh, try to get out of the you know some people they, they really struggle with this so you have to make a conscious effort even if it's just looking at a clock trying to pace yourself a little bit say okay I've talked a lot here maybe I should <laughs> stop okay uh, what do you think uh, or okay let me just uh shut up for a minute you know I want to hear your, your thoughts on this you know sometimes you have to get to that point uh, apply the rules of active listening uh, avoid the multitasking and uh, another big thing and I think we're kind of guilty of this you get somebody on the phone especially if they're like this and they're just going on and on and on and on, and on. Uh, you might be tempted to oh, let me just check my email real quick <laughs> oh well what's that what's that little little kitty over there <laughs> oh, that's a fun little <laughs> that's a fun little oh what 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 were you saying oh my god I, sorry I was uh <laughs> whoops uh, take notes on important points uh, summarize the next steps at the end of the call you know again just good business procedure good business communication uh, appreciation yes thanks for taking the time for this call not taking it for granted uh, following up on the agreements so now let's look at this time devoted to calling among business professionals so again this, this kind of surprises me because this, this is not what I would have expected uh, but they're saying that most people spend about two to five hours on the phone per week <laughs> you kind of wonder like what are these people doing <laughs> you know if they're not emailing and they're not on the phone uh, what are they doing but, but anyway you can see that and then about 14.4 percent said they spend over 15 hours and of course this would vary depending on the type of business that is you know how much how much information are you going to be communicating that does need to be immediate uh, or confidential or sensitive you know obviously if that kind of place it'd be more phone calls uh, sample meeting requests agendas for a phone call all right so this is very formal might be overkill <laughs> a lot of situations uh, but you know you can see it's clearly set up who to call oh this is a website development meeting okay it said it was a phone call uh, or I guess it maybe it is a phone call so it's a phone call about a website okay <laughs> <laughs> it took me three tries <laughs> so this is a request for an agenda for a phone call so the topic of the phone call would be a website development meeting and they just say yes maybe no and then they got the goals what what you want to talk about etc so you probably wouldn't do this obviously every phone call but if it's something that's really important and significant and you want to again be very professional and official with it you would do this and then here's the follow-up to the phone call about the website so uh, hello Hans honeys <laughs> uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about the new website attach the document I believe we agreed to finish it blah, blah, blah date agreed to the following roles so again nice uh, bulleted list there with the the bold there so your eye pops to the most relevant information perfect 
All right, so here's some advice about leading group voice in video calls, and this is a lot more common than you might think. Uh, I've done a lot of these, and it is something that you have to warm up to. You need a little practice before you get good at. Uh, so practice the technology before the group call. You know, especially if this is, say, a job interview, and they say we'll be using Skype, uh, and you'll be interviewed by, you know, the committee here <laughs> over Skype. Uh, you don't want that to be the first time you've ever loaded Skype. Okay, uh, what I always do, if it's, especially if it's critical, you know, I'll get a friend on Skype or just a friend hanging around the office, colleague, whatever. And uh, matter of fact, we did this in the whole, the whole English, uh, my whole little hallway, <laughs> all my colleagues. We, we had a new uh, technology out. It was a Skype for uh, business. And uh, we just said, you know, it'd be a pretty good idea. Let's just all, we'll all Skype together. We'll just try this out, see where the, see if there's any problem. And we all did that. And it was great. But we all, kind of, we all kind of practiced it, so if we ever need to use it, uh, we'll, we'll know that we've got, we at least we tried it out. Everything seems to work. Uh, the webcam effectively. Uh, so some people, uh, they just have a webcam on. It's not even showing their face. You know, that's kind of useless, <laughs> just showing a blank screen the whole time. Uh, you want to think about what's in the background. Uh, and again, thinking about people like to see your face, right? They, they, they can tell a lot from your facial expressions. Uh, or you might put some stuff in the background that's conducive uh, uh, to the topic. Uh, you, might, you might even go so far as to get a green screen. Put that back there, but that's, that's again, probably overkill. Uh, one of the problems I noticed with these PowerPoints, one of the reasons I don't just have my webcam going the whole time is uh, sometimes this uh, webcam can get in the way of the words on the slide. You know, so that'd be an example there of ineffective <laughs> webcam use. At that point, it's ineffective. It's blocking uh, the info. Uh, using the interactive tools wisely, so just being aware they exist. You know, there's a, a lot like Skype, for example, you could say, share my screen. And then you could just show them, uh, you know, here's here's how to use this part of D2L. And you can just open up that and show it to them. That's pretty uh, wise. Of course, they had to click on a thing that says, uh, OK. There's other kind of features, too, like little polls you can do. Uh, some of the software lets people uh, raise their hand, basically, uh, to ask a question. But start the call with a purpose and take charge, because hey, if you don't, uh, people will just get off on a million different things. So again, you want to get right to the point, get this done, because attentions are short. Uh, follow the guidelines of effective uh, virtual meetings. All right, Whew. Uh, again, <laughs> lots of info. Feel pretty good about this, though. Okay, so what have we, what are the takeaways here? We talked about this language uh, for talking about different communication channels. So th these will come up again, and especially as a professional communicator at a workplace, uh, trying to teach people how to communicate well, uh, you want to be aware of these terms uh, so you can <laughs> sound intelligent. <laughs> so with the richness of email, we said, not really very rich. Yeah, we don't have the facial expressions. Uh, we don't have the body language. Uh, we don't have the, the voice, so you can hear the tone of the voice. So not a very rich medium. Uh, same thing, I guess, with the, uh, the uh, instant messaging. A phone call, though, you do have a lot more richness with that because you can hear the sound of their voice. Uh, the control being another factor. You know, how much control will you have over this <laughs> communication? Uh, an email, lots of control. Right? You sort of decide when you want to read it, when you want to respond to it. You can edit it. Uh, the phone call, not as much control. Maybe somebody just calls you out of the blue. Uh, there's no planning there, <laughs> no control. Uh, constraints, so you can't, you know, <laughs> I don't get too many attachments over the telephone. Right? So that's a constraint with that medium. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want to go willy-nilly with the attachments on those other, even if it is email, because I don't know what, what their inbox looks like. I don't know what kind of storage they have. Uh, maybe they don't even have the capability sometimes to make a video call. Uh, so that could be a very serious constraint if they don't have a webcam, etc. Uh, writing effective emails, we've talked about this, the, the subject line, the formatting. Uh, again, I think it's good not to really think about email being any, any different substantially than a business letter or a business memo. Uh, emotions in uh, online communication. And we said there the goal is not, it's not that you can't, or that you want to become Spock, <laughs> be completely stoic all the time, not have emotion. You know, that's not what we're saying. It's just about uh, being aware of your emotions, managing the emotions in a productive way. Uh, take us some time 
you know, if you if, if you uh, get this email, you're really flustered, you're really upset about it. Hey, it's okay. Go out, take a take a walk. Uh, maybe reply quickly and just say, um, "Thanks for email. I need some time to think about this. I'll get back to you tomorrow." Uh, that sort of thing. It's you know anything. Even to me, I think it's better just not to reply at all uh, than to reply hastily, sort of in the heat of that emotion. Uh, but anyway, just being aware of that and uh, you know, not not let it, controlling it, not not letting it control you, I think is the goal. Uh, effective instant messaging and oh yeah, one other thing with this too. We we talked about the uh, those two effects, uh, the neutrality effect and the negativity effect. I think that's very important. Uh, so in the uh, the neutral effect, you want it to be positive, but it might be there's a chance it could be perceived as neutral. Uh, that's the first one. But really, the the worst one is you just want it to be neutral, but there's a good chance it might be um, taken in negatively. You know, that's a response of the uh, that says <laughs> the reason for that is the medium is not rich. All right, it's not a rich medium. Uh, they can't hear you. They can't see you. Uh, so these two effects uh, kick in. So very important to be aware of that. Uh, effective instant messaging in the workplace, right? Just because it's instant messaging doesn't mean that everybody's using text speak and so on. Uh, digital message overload, so some strategies for managing that inbox. And you know, I think you could probably go on all day about that, but uh, the important thing is to be thinking about it. Don't let yourself get overwhelmed. Uh, don't, you know, let this be the endless time sink for you. You know, work out some strategies for coping with that. Effective uh, phone conversations and video conferences. Again, a lot of the same principles apply, but there are some uh, substantial differences. Okay, it's about an hour and a half into this. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, I think with this topic in particular, I'd like, really like you to take, uh, to, you know, share some of your stories with this stuff. You know, what are some things you thought about during the uh, the lecture? Uh, I'd like to hear some some things that have happened. Uh, to your things you've observed, or you know, maybe part of this was especially useful or whatever, uh, just let me know. I uh, always appreciate any questions, comments, or, or stories. Anyway, I'll stop it here, and I hope you have a great day.